this episode of China Unscripted, a new disease is spreading in China, while the U.S. faces pandemonium. And could China interfere in the next U.S. election? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And Shelley, unfortunately, has been subsumed by Matt's mustache. She. What is that supposed to mean, Chris? Uh, your mustache requires protein to generate. Okay. Great. So uh, that's a weird start to the podcast. It is. Uh, since it's Matt and I, we can finally do our sports podcast commentator. So how about them Dodgers? They're coming in with a home run down the bend, and uh, Jimmy is the lucky horse. It, it would be far more apropos to talk about basketball or football this season. Why? Uh, no particular reason. Do sports have seasons? No. Well, whatever. Fine, we'll talk about China then. Since All right, that's something China. we're apparently better at, maybe. So uh, there's there's a, there's a horrible new disease spreading in China, and hey, Trump and Biden go into an election while a disease in China is spreading. Well, it's not just in China. The, this is the the mycoplasma pneumonia. Yeah. Is what they're what, what they're, they're calling, calling it, mm -hmm. which is a is a bacterial pneumonia, mm -hmm. and it seems to be uh, higher cases than normal reported in uh, Ohio and uh, some countries in Europe. Oh, I mean, it's already so it's already it's already international. Now, what I've read about it is that it it's somewhat cyclical in the sense that something like this happens every you know seven ten years. Like there's a there's a cycle for pneumonias. Mm -hmm. um, so, I guess the question now is is what's happening in China this but like an extremely bad version right mm -hmm. because at different times pneumonias can be more or less deadly it's like right? sports they have seasons that's right this is this is what i've learned today what have you learned today um but yeah like i'm hearing from people i know in china that like you know they, they have it it's way worse than covid uh high fever very painful uh dizziness and you know they're in hospitals that are completely overrun with like two doctors on staff well, I mean, like COVID was pretty bad for people who got it. Uh, well, I mean, there was a ver there was a variety, right? And what seems to be the case with this one is it's it's targeting young people more. Like you know, young healthy people didn't have as severe, typically as severe reactions to COVID. Right. With this case, like my friend is my, is young, healthy, so this mm. is this seems different. Your friend who's in China now, yeah. and was telling you about all this, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and there was like huge lines at hospitals and like totally inadequate staffing, at least from this one anecdotal report. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and so, I mean, the one thing that like really st stood out to me was the fact that the Chinese Communist Party admits that there is something going on because after everything that happened with COVID, after everything that happened with zero COVID, I don't think they would even acknowledge that there's any kind of illness going in China unless it was already such that they couldn't cover it up. Yeah, and I and I think that the pressures are a little different because now people are more suspicious, mm -hmm. right? Because I think it's broadly understood, including by the World Health Organization at this point, that there was a cover-up in China mm -hmm. for COVID-19. Uh, and now there's just like, the, the Communist Party kind of realizes that. And then the, there's the other thing, which is that I don't think, uh, I think from Xi Jinping's perspective, it is not possible to do a zero pneumonia type lockdown mm -hmm. because the social unrest that resulted from zero COVID was so great that I think the party really freaked out. Definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah, people actually calling for Xi Jinping and the Communist Party to step down. Yeah. Uh, plus the economic impact. Sure. Yeah. And China was already reeling from pretty severe economic uh hit after zero COVID and, you know, a few other factors, uh, including less Western investment in China than than before. Yeah, yeah. A bunch of countries are, uh, well, I mean, yeah, there's, there's less uh, importing, exporting going on. Uh, China's manufacturing is contracting. I think this is like the second month in a row it's contracted more than expected. And I mean, you got to keep in mind, even like if, when you go around and like, you know, go to your favorite local crack or, cracker barrel, and you see made in China stuff, uh, like keep in mind that's not like loads of money going back to China because you know everything is, is state run, state subsidies. 
their profit margin on things that they're selling is probably not as high as you would think. No, but also even Cracker Barrel. Like I remember when when you and I were in Palm Beach in 2017. When remember when when you were trying to interview Xi Jinping oh, during right. his visit with yeah. Trump, uh, and we went to Cracker Barrel mm -hmm. and like. Everything we looked at was made in China, like the American flag hats, like yeah. made in China, right? Everything. Uh, and I went to a Cracker Barrel in Mississippi earlier this year, and I was just looking just out of curiosity. And there was there were very few made in China things. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of like um, Vietnam, Indonesia, some made in USA, but it was definitely like a f it was very different. And things have clearly changed in. Oh my gosh, it's been six years. I can't believe how time wow. goes by. Yeah. Uh, we, neither of us had facial hair then. It was a very different era. Really? I didn't, not even me? Not even you, wow. Chris. That's crazy. Yeah, I always think back about that uh, that 30 Rock episode where uh, they decide to like manufacture a sofa made in the USA, mm -hmm. to, like bring back American manufacturing. But like everyone's forgotten how to make a sofa and like it's this horrible deformed thing that's like torturous <laughs> to sit in sit in and eventually like the joke at the end of the episode is that like the u.s government hires them to make this sofa as a torture device oh, gosh. uh to like you know extract information from terrorists but but this is like an actual thing like right. people what? think like you can just restart manufacturing in the u.s but it's actually complicated because the know-how is gone we saw that with mask manufacturing like it took time for uh i think it was like six or eight months before your other American factories were able to start pumping out masks. And that's something as simple as a mask. Right. I, I uh, recently bought a new sofa mm -hmm. and I, I really wanted something that was made in the US. Mm -hmm. And I just like really prioritized this and did a lot of like different shopping around. And it was so hard to find. But eventually uh, I found a manufacturer. It took six months. I mean, it was a custom order, so it took time. Mm -hmm. But it, it took six months, and it was probably two and a half times the price of a similar couch that I could have gotten made wow. in China. Like, I just paid so much more for it. And I was willing to do it because, like, I got to put my money where my mouth is, right? But but nonetheless, <laughs> there was that hesitation, like, oh, man, like, am I really doing this for Made in America? Because, like, that's not that's not great. And if there was a lot more of this kind of like carpentry and manufacturing in America, then the prices wouldn't be as high. The wait times wouldn't be as long, like all these things, right? Yeah, I mean, part of the reason so much is made in China is because of different kinds of subsidies that actually make it cheaper to make something on the other side of the world mm -hmm. and then ship it here, which is insane. Yeah. Like that's not, that shouldn't be cheaper. What, what I what I hate about this is like, one, the, the workers in the US factories are paid some kind of living wage. And it's almost always more than um, uh, minimum wage because it's a skilled job, right? Mm -hmm. In China, they're being paid far less, uh, if not so, outright so, slave labor. So, so it's 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 bad to workers. It's also horrible for the environment because those factories are powered often by coal, whereas the U.S. has a somewhat more renewable energy, although it's not not perfect. And then you have the massive carbon impact of shipping things on like you know container ships and shipping them halfway around the world, then loading them onto trucks and then shipping them across the country, right? Like, it's just so inefficient. Mm -hmm. And like, as you point out, like there's subsidies, right? So there's even, th those are just like, like ordinary Chinese people's tax money going to subsidize like cheap labor that's bad for workers and bad for the environment and bad for the US. So you ready for the TLDR? Yes. This is this is going to be one of my hard, extreme opinions, and I'm going to stick to. Couches are bougie. We have perfectly good floors. The ground is there. Just sit on the floor. You don't need chairs, sofas, recliners. Just sit on the floor. It's good. You know, keeps your hips open. You have to have a good posture. It's good for the spine. Forget it. Well, that's just like your opinion, man. It's not. Um, also, I've been to your house and you have a sofa. Well, there is one sofa there, isn't <laughs> there? I keep it there as a reminder of the, the sins of modern society. I like to sit on the floor across from it and look at it and meditate on this. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is what I do when I'm not talking about China. 
I angrily stare at furniture. <laughs> <laughs> and the Chris Chapel lore has been expanded <laughs> for whoever is keeping track. Okay, very few, perhaps. Probably. All right, so anyway, we've talked about this uh, pneumonia that's spreading in China and... Mm. You know, we know something about it, but we still know very little. And it kind of does remind me of like the very early stages of COVID, which at the time was the, the Wuhan virus, according to yeah. Chinese state media. So we can imagine in a couple of months, YouTube will delete this video because of misinformation or something. Because we called it the mycoplasma pneumonia, when in fact, the correct name is, I don't know. Whatever the future will The know. Fort Detrick virus or bacteria or something. Uh, it, so it kind of reminds me of that where it's just like, Something scary is happening in China. It's starting to spread, but we don't know hardly anything about it. Mm -hmm. It's also making kids sick, which which is different, but in a way scarier. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but like, what else? Like, what can we do? Like, there's, there's not like a health directive, and and honestly, like, even if the CDC tried to do some extreme measure, uh, I think people would have a harder time complying with it now because the memories of of three years of COVID lockdowns uh, are still so fresh and stinging for so many people. Yeah, especially as more information is coming out about like the impact on especially children having been kept out of schools for so yeah. long, the different kind of social yeah. socializing problems that are coming out. If it's killing kids like like a really high percentage, then that's one thing. If it's making kids sick for a few weeks, but there's very few deaths, then you, you do have to consider the social impact of keeping kids. I mean, like, like just kids I've talked to since COVID, like I remember asking this, um, this teenager, like, you know, what do you think is the most significant event in your lifetime? And like, for me, it was 9-11. For me, it was the switch. Uh, and so like, I just thought it would be some political thing. And, and she's like, oh, it's for sure COVID. Mm -hmm. Like it just changed everything about, uh, about, um, being social. It changed the thing about friendships and relationships. It changed my relationship with school, uh, changed how I look at history. I'm like, whoa, like I didn't, didn't consider that impact. Mm -hmm. But if you're 14 years old or eight years old or something, and there's like a two year lockdown, this is such a big percentage of your life yeah. that it just changes everything. And uh, I think that m most Americans are aware enough of the dangers of doing that again, that it probably can't happen again like that. Yeah. But I don't know. Well, yeah, I actually have a, a, a big, on my on the other channel, Gamers Unbeaten, I have a whole deep thoughts while gaming about Baldur's Gate and identity. And yeah, identity is, is very much uh, created in relation with other people. Like who you are depends on your relationship with other people. And especially COVID made people very isolated. And that, that definitely has a huge impact on people's identity. And that's pretty important. Yeah. And uh, this is a good episode. So uh, we'll put a link below and you can check that out. Yes. Give it views. Gamers unbeaten. Yep. All right. Shall we talk about something that is potentially even worse than this pneumonia? Uh, well, if it's what... I think you're getting at this is actually better because it's the opposite. Instead of this horrible disease spread, spreading from China, this horrible thing is retreating it's, from the rest of the world and going back to China. Yes. And we are talking about the pandas. pandas. <laughs> yes. The Edinburgh Zoo has uh, sent back its pandas um, at the uh, November 30th, end of, end of November. And they are not getting more. They're not getting more. And, and for context, um, what has happened in the last several decades is China has, you know, sort of lent pandas to different zoos around the world, but they're never given. They're just on loan. And um, the zoos have to pay something like a million dollars a year uh, for each panda. And on top of that, if the pandas breed and have children, those baby pandas born in America or born in uh, Scotland or whatever, they actually still belong to China and not to the, the country or the zoo that they were born in, which is a really unusual situation. 
uh, you know, because that's not how it works. With yeah, you. and the pandas are really expensive. Like zoos, like it's they can easily be spending like a million dollars a year on these pandas. Oh yeah, and like the idea is like you know hopefully it brings in. Well, I mean they say it's about conservation and blah blah blah. No, it's about zoos attracting people. Like anyone who's played Zoo Tycoon knows, it's about getting the people in to get the money. Right. But it's very easy for the pandas to actually be so expensive that they're not making that money back. This has affected other conservation efforts because it's just so expensive because people like these stupid pandas. When I sit opposite my sofa and glare at my sofa, I'm also thinking about pandas and how much they're a waste as well. Ah. Yeah. The good news the, is the U.S. will soon have no pandas. Well, so the the Washington, D.C. sent their pandas back recently, and mm -hmm. the last zoo in the U.S. to have pandas is Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And in theory, they're slated to uh, send those to China in sometime in yeah. 2024. Like, uh, I think they're they've usually got, given on 10-year contracts, and those right. are expiring. Right. They, they've got two adults and two cubs. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, while I understand your hatred for pandas- it's very understandable. I, I think there's, that there's another strategy that, that we could take here mm -hmm. as the US. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the Communist Party demands the return of these pandas, right? Including ones that were born in the US. Yeah. Um, now, I think that, that if the Communist Party does some kind of like aggressive but short of war tactic, for example, like a certain uh, espionage incident or a or a South China Sea incident, you know, or diplomatic kind of thing, right? Well, in general, well, China is consciously using short of war tactics right. all the time. Right, and so like, it's very hard for the US to respond to that because it's like, well, it wasn't bad enough that we should start a war over it, but it's not, it's not nothing and we should respond somehow, but it's very hard to respond because there's no symmetric response. Yeah. A good example is the artificial islands in the South China Sea. Right. China claims this whole South China Sea is their territory. They start building these artificial islands and the US is like, don't do that. But obviously them starting to pile up sand is not a reason to go to war. Right. And, and so China ignores them. Gradually, gradually, a little more sand, a little more sand. Now it's now, now it's not a shoal, it's an island. And people are living, Chinese people are living on there. And so then right. the US is like, okay, just don't militarize them. And then they do. Right. And like at no point, at, at no point is it's always short of war. You're not going right. to get into a nuclear war with China because of sand. Right. But now all these islands are militarized. And it's like, if there ever is a war, they are now strategically much better off. Right. So I, I think the US should respond with its own short of war tactics. And not because it's cunning or devious, but simply because the CCP needs to know that we are in on their game, right? And so one thing we could do is we could keep the pandas. Mm -hmm. And that's a short of war tactic. And the China's not gonna go to war over it. They'll issue angry statements. Well, not just keep the pandas. That's not what you, you're thinking. Oh, no, I, well, that, that the pandas born in the yes, US that's, that's the become essentially the equivalent of US citizens. Birthright citizenship for pandas. Yes. Uh, so f firstly, like I agree with that in general. Um, that any any pandas born here should have been U.S. Uh, owned or protected, uh, and the idea of sending them back to China when they've never been to China and there's been many cases like this over the years. That's absurd. That's crazy to me. Especially because caring for the pandas is so expensive. U.S. zoos do foot the bill in addition to what they are paying to China. Right. Uh, they are responsible for every all the funding, the upkeep of these. Right. And, and I understand there's a bill in Congress uh, that would do something like this. Um, although, you know, obviously, you know, most bills in Congress do not ever become laws, but there's well, a discussion of it. Well, and it'll be a moot point it. if uh, soon we don't have any pandas. Yeah. So the, the, the key is to keep these, you know, four pandas, the two adults and the two cubs in Atlanta, and just keep them uh, long enough that then we can use it at an appropriate time. Uh, and I think I think this would be overall good. The only downside is then, you know, from your perspective, Chris, there yeah. are pandas. Well, uh, another alternative is, you know, the best way to uh, ensure the rapid growth of the panda population, which it used to be considered endangered. It's now vulnerable. So that's a step up. Um, if we breed pandas as a source for meat, 
then there will be loads of pandas because it will become a profitable and tasty staple of the American diet. Right. It's like, wh why are pigs and cows and chickens never going to become extinct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, while I don't agree with you mm. uh, morally, I do practically agree with you that it, it, it would work. What's the morality of eating pandas? Like, I don't know. I, I would just feel so much worse eating a panda than eating a cow. And I, I, I understand why that's in, from some perspective kind of absurd. Like they're, they're, they're like kind of equivalent in terms of size. And a panda would eat you if he had the chance. Thinks, yeah. yeah. I don't know about that, Chris. Well, pandas mostly eat bamboo, although they do occasionally eat meat if they're starving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I and I recently learned from the Joe Rogan podcast that uh, apparently black bears, that uh, their diet's mostly blueberries, mm -hmm. are delicious. Blueberries are delicious, or the black the, bears. The are black bears that eat the the blueberries. Yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't eaten a bear since when I played Oregon Trail. Well, you know, Davy Crockett, he killed him a bear when he was only three. Yes, Davy, Davy, Davy Crockett. Crockett. He was the king of the wild frontier, but we don't allow kings in America, so we got rid of him. Yes, yes, we did. Uh, all right, so. Uh, that's pandas. That's pandas. Moving on. We don't need Shelly. What does she add to this? Nothing. Not a thing. God, what do we talk about next? <laughs> oh my God. Well, I, I think that, that we are facing, uh, the end of, I hope, the end of a really, really horrible era in terms of US-China relations and potentially the beginning of a new, uh, somewhat less bad era, which is the death of diplomat Henry Kissinger, who was sort of the first American to go to China to, to start of jumpstart relations. He went in, I think, 71 on a secret trip and met with Zhou Enlai and like, you know, tried to like move things in a direction to warm relations with the Chinese Communist Party as a way to counterbalance the threat of the Soviet Union. Obviously, like we've seen the trajectories of these things. And now, you know, 50 years later, it's like, oops, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, like, I think you could make an argument that maybe at the time with the Vietnam War going on, with the Cold War, with the Soviet Union, there may have been a geopolitical strategic use for aligning with uh, the PRC. Um, but that did not need to carry on. Clinton did not need to normalize trade relations. Right. I, I mean, the, this is this is a problem with politics is there's a lot of inertia. Uh, it's cause sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad thing. In the case of this, uh, it was very hard to, to change that moment of inertia. But then once it was changed on this trajectory of warming China relations, it just never stopped, right? And so even as it became increasingly clear that this relationship was not as good for the US as it was for China, and in many cases, bad for the US, it still continued on that trajectory. I mean, it's what cost uh, Taiwan recognition from the US. Like part of the agreement was that uh, the U.S. recognize the PRC instead of the Republic of China as the legitimate government of China. Yeah, and like the the inertia for that continued because decades later, like the U.S. still doesn't recognize that Taiwan is an independent country. Oh, we don't want to anger China. Yeah, the the great thing that came out of uh, like all this talk about Kissinger is, is I saw this video. We can put it up on screen where Mao is meeting Kissinger's wife, who was like this tall socialite. Socialite, oh, Matt, help. Socialite. Thank you. Uh, I I don't get good sleep because I I don't believe in beds and sofas. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's hilarious. He's like, oh, he's, she's so tall, and he's they're both short. It's very funny, as the yes. audience can see, because they get to see this when, video. When there's one person who's tall and the other short, it's very funny. It's like the movie Twins with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. That's right. right? It is inherently a funny movie just because of that visual. And I am so mad they never made the sequel 
Yeah, did you hear about this? No, what? Uh, the, I, I think the what would have come out is that there was a third one, and that was going to be played Eddie by Murphy. Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Oh my god, I was just guessing that. I was, no, like, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, what's the most absurd twin pair to have at that era? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would have been hilarious. It's like we could oh, have man. had we could have had that movie. We could have had uh, Gremlins three. This, this All the sequels history that didn't went get off. Made. Yeah, yeah, and and yet we get we get three Fifty Shades of Grey movies. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah. Fast and Furious X, sponsored yeah. by Twitter. Is it? <laughs> no, I think there's also an Exorcist X. Yeah, people like X. Like why? Why? There's, why, why? there's too many. It's such an extreme <laughs> letter in the alphabet. Extreme. Yeah, yeah. I use that purposefully. Okay. Um, so we're talking about um, the launch of China Uncensored X, the new, newest and most extreme version of China Uncensored. It's, it's like us talking about China issues while snowboarding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> down like that, like the Alps, you know, <laughs> from hel helicopters. Yeah, yeah, we we jump out of helicopters with machine guns and snowboard down, shooting wild boards. <laughs> those those two things in the same place this would be is, very extreme. This is great. Um, yeah, so much better than having Shelley keep us on track. Yeah. So, so anyway, Henry Kissinger's dead. Um, yeah, and largely we're kind. Of, well, I don't know. I don't know where the engagement school is going because uh, it seems like the Biden administration, the engagement school, is kind of winning the idea that we need to have some kind of engagement with China. Yeah, uh, and yet there's a lot of inertia from the Trump era, which is that by and large. Biden has continued. And the, he still calls the, him the, a dictator. Yeah. I, oh, that was such a great video where Biden calls Xi Jinping. He's like, oh, well, he is a dictator. He's a, the leader of a communist country. And then Anthony Blinken was like, oh. But just like seeing Xi Jinping at APEC and seeing that room full of business leaders like Tim Cook, Big Pharma, right. uh, like all standing up and giving him a standing ovation. Uh, like that's that's pretty scary. Yeah. Well, I mean, big pharma is probably happy about this newest uh, pneumonia as well, right? Yes. It's just opportunity. Yeah. You can make a buck. So. Yeah. The other thing that came out of APEC is I, I kind of think it blew up uh, Newsom's shot at being a presidential candidate. Mm. Don't uh, don't underestimate the power of people to fail upwards. Well, I think just. Like, I, I know Newsom was trying to position himself as, like, a potential candidate if Biden doesn't run or right. dies. I don't know. But, but like, he, like, the amount of the PR disaster of, like, San Francisco being cleaned up, all the poop cleaned up, the homeless shuffled away for Xi Jinping was just such bad optics. I, I, I don't yeah. think he, like, it, a presidential campaign could survive that. It's incredible how much they cleaned up San Francisco ahead of Xi Jinping's visit. And because I was there only last year, and I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast, but like I was walking through downtown, like UN Plaza, and I saw in the uh, 20 minutes, I saw two different homeless men overdose. Wow. Uh, and like, by the time I saw the second one, the first one was being carried off in, an, in a, like an ambulance or a fire mm -hmm. uh, ambulance. And um, fire ambulance. Well, no, it's like it was like S, uh, SF fire department, mm -hmm. but it was an ambulance because okay. you know the fire department has their own their own system as well. That's not the point. The point is, uh -huh. it was horrible, and it, it wasn't just the overdoses. It was just so many homeless people, uh, and they were you know they were given showers and food and everything. And there was what blew my mind is there were a lot of these people in these like um, vests that were like. Uh, sort of some kind of social workers or community workers whose job it was is to kind of like keep people safe or like, you know, call 911 if there's an overdose uh, or like make sure people had access to the showers. But they, their job wasn't to like make things better for the city or even long-term for any of these people. It was just like to like help them continue to be homeless. And that was, I would say, a, f a policy failure. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this cleanup uh, shows that it could have been done. And you're right, like that looks really bad for Governor Gavin Newsom, but think about the other things he has survived, right? He survived a recall election after horrible mishandling of COVID, including incidents like eating at 
the French Laundry, which is like the super fancy French restaurant with a bunch of people unmasked during the height of COVID after saying people shouldn't go to restaurants. He closed all the public schools because of COVID and yet sent his children to private schools, which were still open. Uh, and he also did such a bad job with masks. He ended up having to buy $3 billion worth of Chinese masks. Yeah, he's very uh, close with China. It It is uh, like he's made a lot of mistakes, right? And he survived the recall election, which is to say people still might think that he is the least bad candidate. Mm, I don't think so. Because with the recall election you were talking about within California, and there are some crazy parts of California, uh, being able to sell that to the entirety of the United States, I think is is a much taller order. Yeah, maybe. The, the problem with Gavin Newsom being president uh, with respect to China, which is obviously the focus of our of our discussion, is that uh, he does not understand the Communist Party. He's very it, much it, engagement. California it, in general has been very much engagement it, it's with like, China. Like Biden, you know, Biden at least gets that the Xi Jinping's a dictator, right? He gets that it's a communist country. Yeah, he specifically he's, said a communist He's like, dictator. you know, said many times that that U.S. will defend Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But Gavin Newsom, like he went to China recently on his own mm -hmm. to like solve climate change. And he met with Xi Jinping, which at the time Biden couldn't. Yeah, like that's insane to me, right? So obviously like he would be the candidate that the Chinese Communist Party uh, would prefer over Biden and certainly over uh, almost any Republican candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so think about the level of support that a pro-China candidate can get, right? You get financial support from totally independent Chinese American businesses. Mm -hmm. United uh, Front. You, you get, right? I mean, there's a whole Clinton scandal in the like 90s or that kind of thing. And the, then there's um, also the like, uh, you know, social media bots and that, that kind of thing where like the, there's so many um, influence campaigns where China and Russia does this too, right? Try to influence elections. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party's interest is elevating candidates that are CCP friendly. So they're going to, you know, uh, pull no punches in terms of like full on media, social media campaigns to promote a candidate that they like, which is why, again, I don't think Gavin Newsom's career is necessarily over. I do think there's a chance he could fail up. I never said his career was over. I said, I don't think he, I think it killed his chances of being president. Okay, well, I, I disagree, but you know what, Chris? One of us is gonna be wrong and yeah. the other's gonna be right, and we'll see. I also remember when you were adamant that Trump would not be the candidate in 2024. Uh, yeah. Yes. I probably I probably was adamant about that. I don't uh -huh. remember being that adamant, but- Oh, but, I do. But we just I should have recorded it at the time. Oh, this wasn't on the podcast. This no, was no. just a discussion. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think this is, I mean, you make a good point about why uh, China, China's ability to influence elections. We, we need to look at Taiwan because Taiwan has an election very soon. And we have been seeing a lot of uh, Chinese influence in these elections, uh, including <laughs> Terry Go, the, the, the Foxconn guy. Uh, he was running as an independent. And essentially the concern was that he would split the pro-China vote in Taiwan. So China did like a bunch of crackdowns on Foxconn and then suddenly he decided to drop out of the race. Oof. But not before he had the brilliant idea of uh, getting the pro-China candidates all together and like doing this thing where they were like, okay, we'll all unite. So, you know, none of us are splitting the pro-China vote. They didn't call it the pro-China vote, but the people who were more willing to engage with China. Uh, and so they did this thing where it's like, you know, we'll decide who the leading candidate is based on like these polls, but they couldn't agree to like what the margin of error was. And so they invited like all of the media to like come see this event. And instead of being this like, you know, great unifying thing, it completely broke down as they all started fighting with each other and arguing with each other. And yeah, it was broadcast to 23 million Taiwanese people. Yeah. So, so the... You know, for for our viewers, like there's more than two parties in in Taiwan, but the the current um, ruling party is the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, 
and they're a progressive party on you know issues that like you know certain social issues and like you know uh, LGBT but they're also very anti uh, Chinese Communist Party influence so it doesn't align left right like it does in the United States yeah um but but this and, and they're running William Lai who was the current vice president. Mm -hmm. He's like a pretty solid, he's a very, very, very solid candidate for that party. People respect him. He's super honest, very, very smart. And, uh, and his running it, mate now is a Xiaobi Kim, which has like really good connections to the US. She's like the, the US essentially like head diplomat, right? Yeah, essentially like if we recognize Taiwan as a country, be she would be the ambassador, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so so that that party doesn't seem so fractured. So they have a they have a better chance just from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm not going to predict the outcome of an election. No, uh, no. Based on my track record, apparently. Uh, but yeah, hopefully it will go DPP, uh, like the other the other major party, the KMT, the Kuomintang. Uh, so sad. I bet um, Chiang Kai Shek is rolling over in his grave. That. His party that he wanted to take back China is now the pro, pro engagement. One. Yeah, yeah, and and to, you know to be clear for our viewers, it's not that we're taking sides in Taiwan's internal politics, but more that that with respect to dealing with the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan has a, I think in both of our views, a much better chance of survival with the DPP as it currently stands on China. Yeah, so like one the, oh, I'm blanking on his name right now, but like the one of the leading. Uh, Guomintang candidates is like he 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 says he he would agree to like the 1992 consensus basically proposed a one country two systems model for Taiwan right which is insane to even like consider did they after. not see what just happened in Hong Kong like yeah. it just happened now well, I guess it was like three four years ago like now. half the people that we interviewed in Hong Kong are now in jail or in exile for, or in exile for political crimes right like. Oh my gosh, that's why? Why would you why would you think this is a good idea? So Taiwan is really important. It's important that people like look at what the CCP is doing in there. And you know, I I hope that we are entering a new era of US China relations. And I I think I think inevitably we are somewhat because it started sort of midway through Trump's term, this mm. this shift from Right. Uh, I mean, I, even when Trump in the beginning was was like, oh, you know, let's do a trade deal. Right. But like by the end of his term, it was like very clear. He's like, you know, we signed a deal. And before the ink was even dry, uh -huh. they sent this virus to us. And, you know, I, I'm not clear. I agree that that they sent it to us. But but like nonetheless, his whole China policy shifted and it affected the Biden administration and Congress has changed. And we can, we're not going back exactly. But there are still so many interests in people from the Kissinger era who are in the US government in various capacities. They're cabinet members, they're uh, Congress members, they're uh, working in the State Department in various capacities uh, that, are, that are still in this Henry Kissinger school. And they either haven't woken up or they have, but they are kind of like lying to themselves because they don't want to admit just how horribly wrong they were. And like, that's something I can understand because I lie to myself all the time because I don't want to admit my past mistakes. So it's very understandable. It's just a tragedy for, you know, everyone else. That's beautifully said, Matt. Beautifully said. Thank you for watching this episode of the China Unscripted Sportscast. I'm Chris Chappell. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And we'll play ball next time. The ball, they do balls in sports, right? Yes. Yes. Yes.